he remains one of history's most shadowy figures. A faceless killer who destroyed life with impunity. And yet children continue to play games in his name. The English language is littered with his euphemisms and slang. Money for old rope. One for the road. A leap in the dark. What do we know of the real men who followed this deadly calling? Britain's executioners were common working men. Labourers, cobblers, barbers, publicans, salesmen. Many remained completely anonymous. And the whole thing is secret. My daughter didn't know, and I've got a son, he didn't know either. And they don't know now. A few, however, achieved celebrity and, for reasons noble or otherwise, changed the process of judicial executions beyond recognition. For a century, these changes took place behind prison walls, in secret. But it wasn't always that way. Of all methods of execution, why, since the 12th century, did the British favour hanging? The government wanted it to be a deterrent. Now, a quick death isn't half as much a deterrent as seeing two or three minutes of appalling suffering and mutilation. Dispensing such a death was cheap and simple. Anyone could do it. The condemned person had to climb a ladder, which was propped against a gallows tree. And then the executioner standing on the ground would simply and thus leave him swinging in empty space like a coat and a wardrobe. Death by strangulation would follow. It was slow, agonizing, and deliberately brutal. The most shameful of deaths. The man who had been detailed to make sure that the condemned had been executed was the local sheriff. That official would no more dream of executing a person than fly to the moon, and so he subcontracted the job out to anyone who would accept it. Some people actually, you know, sought out the job. They, they'd seen executions, they thought they could do it, and others were sort of coerced into it. They were, you know, convicted criminals who were given the choice of you carry out the execution and get a, a reduction in sentence. Hangmen were called upon to perform many other gruesome and bloody punishments. Flogging, whipping, branding, beheading. Hangmen became synonymous with savagery. They were shunned, even beaten. Why the public abused the executioner, I don't know, because there was no point in having police or judges or juries if after the man or woman had been condemned to death, everyone said, oh, well, that's it, let's go home. End of process. Between the 19th centuries, public executions had become a grim form of mass entertainment. Regrettably, there's no television or radio or mass media in those days, and so they would get up early in the morning and let's take the kids to the execution a great day out. Some of the more notorious executions would draw crowds of 100,000 people. They were totally unruly. There'd be pickpockets, you know, mugging, a lot of crime, prostitution. The actual event itself became difficult to police. In the climate of social and penal reform of Victorian Britain, there were those inside and outside Parliament who began to doubt the deterrent value of public executions. They said, well, all right, we'll, we'll reach the point where we're not really prepared to abolish execution in its entirety, because public opinion wouldn't accept that because of the crime rate. But can we take it out of the public view and execute them behind the prison walls? In 1868, public executions were abolished, and behind prison walls, in secret, the method of execution was about to change forever. Why it did is the remarkable story of William Marwood, the unlikeliest hangman of all. If Pa killed Ma, who'd kill Pa? Ma would.
In the 1870s, this little Lincolnshire cottage was a cobbler's shop. Its proprietor was William Marwood. A quiet, respectable man who bore more than a passing resemblance to Prince Albert. Marwood was already in his 50s when he applied for the post of hangman. Why he did so is something of a mystery. Like most people, he'd read press reports of the brutal executions performed by the hangman of the day, William Calcraft. Well, William Calcraft holds the record of being executed for 45 years from 1829 to 1874. And he also holds the record of using the shortest rope, which is rarely more than three feet in length, which meant, of course, that the condemned person strangled to death five, 10, 15 minutes. Howard thought he could do better, that hanging could and should be more humane. Marwood had the idea that rather than strangle a man to death, if you break his spine at the, at the very top, death comes a lot quicker. Marwood's main innovation was to use a longer drop, whereas Calcraft had favoured a drop of two foot, three foot, Marwood was favouring drops of six foot, seven foot. His reasoning took it off from there. That would depend on quite a few factors. His weight, his physical development, his age, his frailty perhaps. If the victim was a very heavy man, he might be travelling so fast that you'd tear his head off. At the rear of his cottage, Marwood experimented by dropping weighted sacks and calculating the force expended. But to do the job on a man, he would need new tools. On many occasions, the poor quality ropes used by former hangmen had broken. Marwood commissioned special new ropes made of the finest Italian silk hemp. They were soft, pliable and much less likely to break. Most importantly, they dispensed with the clumsy slip knot. A large brass eye was used to form the noose. Marwood wanted to keep it tight against the neck to deliver maximum force at the end of the drop. To stop it slipping, he fashioned his own leather washer. The authorities were persuaded to give this new man a chance and experiments with the long drop began. Incredibly enough, it, it actually worked in the vast majority of cases. Marwood was always careful and deliberate in his preparations. If there was any criticism of the new hangman, it was his slowness. Nonetheless, his reputation for calm efficiency spread. And with the rapid growth of the railways, he was soon conducting executions all over the country. By all accounts, he was a man full of bluff good humour. And he was gentle with the condemned, quietly reassuring that they wouldn't suffer. But however well-intentioned, Marwood still had mishaps. When he dropped James Burton at Durham, the loose rope caught under the prisoner's elbow. Burton dangled on the rope, quite alive. The wretched man had to be dragged up and pushed through the open trap to his doom. Marwood never once referred to himself as a hangman, always as an executioner. Once a temperate man who took the occasional gin and water, Marwood had begun to drink. The chief warder of Newgate complained he'd seen Marwood very drunk on more than one occasion. My position, lamented the hangman, is not a happy one. William Marwood died of pneumonia at the age of 63. In eight short years, he'd revolutionized executions and with it, the image of the hangman. Because of Marwood's achievement, the executioner ceased to be a person to be abused. His passing was reported in every paper. 
the whole of his village turned out to mourn the man they called the Gentleman Executioner. The next hangman would not be remembered quite so fondly. James Berry was 31, a shoe salesman from Bradford in Yorkshire. Berry was clear in his mind why he wanted the money. At 10 pounds a time, plus expenses, he could expect to earn as much as 250 pounds a year. No doubt it was a, a fairly well-paid job for one who lacked certain sensibilities. And that figure didn't include the perks of the job. Money for Earl Rowe was an extra income for the executioner who, after the execution of a particularly notorious highwayman or whoever, would then cut up that rope in inch pieces and sell it to the avid crowd as souvenirs, because we all, we all love souvenirs. But on some occasions, it was reported by cynics that the length of rope that was cut up would end of Fleet Street to the other. Berry had known Marwood and learnt from him. When the old hangman died, Berry saw his chance, perhaps the only one he'd get, to be someone. Initially, he was successful. His methods were similar to Marwood's. He used the same sort of rope. You know, he favoured the same longer drops. He then ran into a series of unfortunate incidents. The worst was when he dropped the trap on Robert Goodale at Norwich. The rope straightened and the body vanished. And then the rope flicked up and it became slack and then dropped down into the pit. And on going to the edge of the pit and looking down between the trap doors, they, they saw the body here and the head over there. A most appalling sight. And then there was one infamous incident where the person he tried to hang was not hanged. At Exeter, John Lee was positioned over the trap. Berry pulled the lever, and nothing happened. In panic, Berry and the warders tried stamping on the trap. Eventually, Lee had to be removed from the scaffold. What they didn't do at Exeter, they didn't actually test the apparatus prior to the drop. They didn't, on the day before, put a bag of sand on and you know, test the trap doors. They just assumed it would work. To everyone's horror, a second and third attempt failed. The execution was cancelled. Queen Victoria herself was shocked by the incident and contacted the Home Secretary. The man they could not hang was reprieved. Public outrage led to a committee of inquiry chaired by Lord Aberdare. Berry was summoned as a witness. The hangman had always felt the authorities looked down on him. He resented the fact that judges who passed sentence were referred to as malad, but the hangman who carried out the sentence was treated with disdain. The witnesses giving evidence to the inquiry confirmed this prejudice was real. I think they're always a low class of men and rather prone to take stimulants. I think some of the expressions I've heard them make use of are most unseemly. It ought not to be left to an ignorant hangman. During the latter part of his time, he became addicted to drink. Should not have to bargain with an ignorant hangman for his bungling services. Looking at it cynically, the, the government didn't want to be associated closely with, with someone who was doing a rather a, a nasty job of the day. They knew they had to have someone, but didn't want to take any responsibility for it. Though summoned by the inquiry to account for his actions, it was perhaps typical that Berry should use the occasion to ask for a salary. He's felt yeah, his livelihood depended on execution so much that he shouldn't have to depend on the, uh, the life or death of a man who make his living. Of course, you know, the authorities would have probably taken the opposite view, that that's precisely why we don't want to pay you a full-time salary, because we don't want you simply living off the deaths of others. His request was refused, 
and although he survived the inquiry, his problems were far from over. Berry claimed never to have concerned himself with the guilt or innocence of the condemned. But he was full of contradictions. As a man of faith, he was deeply concerned about the prisoner's eternal soul. And perhaps his own. It was still a tradition for the hangman to ask for forgiveness from the condemned. But Berry went one step further offering his own religious verse. My brother, sit and think, while yet on earth some hours are left to thee. Kneel to thy God, who does not from thee shrink, and lay thy sins on Christ, who died for thee. One of the governors saw this, you know, took offence at it, and Barry was warned off it and told to stop. But atonement seems to have been central to his beliefs. For a prisoner to die without asking God's forgiveness, or even worse, with a lie on their lips, was to bury unthinkable and led to a far more sinister practice. The authorities were always relieved if the condemned made a confession. On occasions when they hadn't, Berry, by his own admission, tried to get one by threatening a slower. There's no suggestion that the authorities are aware of this or condoned it. At home, his walls were covered with photographs of the people he'd hanged. And the house was full of morbid relics. Berry came to believe they exerted an evil influence on his life. Being in constant contact with, with killing had affected him as well. Merwood and Berry were the pioneers of you know, the, the modern method of execution. They were doing all these tests, seeing the results of the you know, miscalculations. They were seeing people's heads pulled off. They were seeing people choked to death. And it affected the nerves. By the end, Berry was taken to drinking quite heavily and I think he just had enough. In 1892, at the age of only 39, James Berry resigned. He soon published his memoirs, an activity frowned upon by the authorities. Despite his experiences, he claimed to believe in the scriptural doctrine of an eye for an eye. And then, in an extraordinary about-face, the former hangman embarked on a lecture tour. Accompanied by these very slides, he appeared in theatres across the country as an opponent to capital punishment. But Berry was either confused or lying. Previously classified documents prove he was still applying for his old job as late as 1902. The authorities were having none of it. James Berry is an unsuitable person and should not be again employed. And he never was. After Berry, nothing in the selection of future hangmen would be left to chance. The authorities wanted anonymous professionals. And as a consequence of the Aberdare report, all future hangmen would be trained constantly scrutinized and effectively. Not all of Berry's mishaps could be blamed on his inexperience. Many of the Aberdeer report's recommendations were mechanical ones. Almost no two prisons had the same equipment. Many had scaffolds in prison yards constantly exposed to the elements. Some were balcony scaffolds. Others were erected in coach houses or death sheds. A home office design for a purpose-built execution suite was introduced. But the conduct of the hangman was the chief concern of Aberdare. Their selection and performance would be strictly monitored by the home office. 
hangmen would no longer be able to use their own ropes and sell them afterwards. Execution equipment would be owned by the prison commission and kept under lock and key. Assistant executioners would have to be engaged on every job. But first, they would have to be trained. The post was never advertised because people were on a regular basis. You'd probably get more applications if it was uh, an infamous criminal about to be executed. I was more interested to see what happened, you know, how they did it. And it's something which only a very few people have the chance to, to see or do. Then they would normally be invited to attend uh, a week's training and certainly from the 1940s onwards be explained uh, the Official Secrets Act and they would be required to sign it. They say you must never tell anyone, even you know, 60 years after, you mustn't tell anybody about what happens there. You're more or less going to a lecture room, you know, where there's an officer there, he tells you all about capital punishment when it started and do you agree with it or not? I suppose you have to say, yes, I agree with this, <laughs> otherwise I might chunk it out. The final test was to witness an execution. I suppose they want to see how you react. I mean, some people wouldn't like to see somebody hung, would they? The fallout rate for assistant executioners was quite high, perhaps realising that they'd taken on something that they really wish they hadn't done. But could any amount of training prepare a man to live with death? It would depend on the man. The story of John Ellis is the most tragic of any hangman. During the first quarter of the 20th century, he hanged more than 200 men and women. His grandson didn't discover his family's dark secret until the 1980s. When my mother got married, she left that behind. She wasn't going to speak about it or say anything about it. The first I heard of it is when she was in sheltered accommodation not long before she died and she was having a bad turn. And the warden came to me and she said, your mother's been saying, her father were an hangman. To all who knew him, John Ellis seemed the least likely candidate to be the state's hired killer. He was a barber from the mill town of Rochdale in Lancashire. It was a career he'd tried to avoid. Ellis hated it. As a boy, he'd craved adventure and twice ran away from home. When he applied for the post of hangman, his family was horrified. His father cut him off, said like, you know, thou shalt not kill, uh, threatened to cut him off without a penny, which he did. He didn't say nothing much to his wife and she didn't want to know nothing about it. It's a bit of a family mystery, really, as to why somebody as sensitive as him should have actually taken the job on, you know. If a kitten had to be put to sleep or got rid of, chickens had to be killed, my grandfather couldn't do it. He never could do it. And my grandma had to do anything like that. Ellis applied to be a hangman, apparently as some sort of bet with some friends he had, you know, they'd read about an execution and Ellis had said to his friends, I can do that, and you know, they said, no, you can't. Ellis applied, went through a successful interview and was trained up. To the authorities, he must have seemed like the perfect executioner. Respectable, discreet, conscientious, and sober. And he quickly became the country's senior executioner, putting away, as he described it, a succession of Edwardian England's most infamous murderers, including the notorious Dr. Crippen. A prison commissioner once described him as the coolest and most self-possessed executioner ever known but he always suffered from something that might best be described as stage fright. He was anxious everything had to be right. You were riding a fine line with an execution. Too much drop, and you, you brought, <laughs> took the man's head off. Too short to drop, and he strangled. Either way, you were out. 
Ellis was no hypocrite. He believed in capital punishment. But if he simply saw himself as an instrument of the law, he went to extraordinary lengths to convince himself of the justness of a sentence, even to the extent of attending trials. And he always wanted to know he was right. That's what upset him. He read the cases, read everything, and he wanted to know he was right. And if he thought that this person shouldn't be hanged, then he wasn't happy about it. In the 1920s, Ellis was called upon to execute several members of the IRA. He had to be issued with a gun, a special branch with a... They, um, they, were, with, they were at the house. Um, my grandma had a gun in her pocket. You know, Irishman called at the door, he had threatening letters from the IRA. Like hangmen before him, Ellis turned to the bottle. He'd get off the tram at the bottom, you know, call the dog and partridge, get a bottle of whiskey and drink the bottle, full bottle of whiskey before he went in the house. This chap was practically teetotal early on in his career. As these records show, the hangman had begun to make mistakes. Two executions late in his career unnerved Ellis more than any others. The first of those was the 18-year-old Henry Jacobi. The hangman was moved to see the youth playing cricket with the death watch warders. I saw the poor lad the day before his death. He was nothing but a child. It was the most harrowing sight I ever saw in my life, and I had to kill him the next day. He was quite affected by it. I mean, I think he was reported as you know, being in tears in the governor's office after he carried out the execution. I think it really upset him. But the worst was yet to come with Edith Thompson. Convicted on purely circumstantial evidence of murdering her husband, Ellis sincerely believed she'd be reprieved. He was wrong. When she had to be dragged in a stupor to the gallows and you know, the, the effect of hanging a woman affected Ellis quite badly. The execution was a ghastly spectacle. Practically unconscious, it took four men to support her on the scaffold. And as soon as it was over, sinister rumours began that Thompson had miscarried on the drop. Whatever the truth, Ellis soon resigned. He'd had enough. He was suffering from depression, nervous trouble, drinking too much. Five months later, John Ellis tried to kill himself. He tried to shoot himself in the throat. The gun must have jerked and he splintered his jawbone. But if the terrible strain of the hangman's duties had led Ellis to despair, it didn't stop him revisiting them. In 1927, he appeared in a play as the executioner William Marwood. For the first time in 60 years, the British public would have a chance to see a real executioner going about his business. On his first appearance, the crowd burst into spontaneous applause. Ellis was only on stage for one minute. He didn't speak a single word. But the media reaction bordered on the hysterical. Ellis was unrepentant, arguing there was no pension for the hangman and that he had to earn a living. He's had to go back to the scaffold because it's uh, like a joiner or a plumber, it's the only thing he knew. When somebody came along and said, oh, well, you know, we can earn so much money doing a show and here offers were made to him, the only thing he had was what he'd always done. But Parliament called it a demoralising spectacle. And although the Home Secretary claimed he had no power to interfere, the play closed within days. I mean, that was a disaster, which brought a lot more pressure on him, put a lot of his own money into it. He got a bit of... a bit of... Flack of trouble at home because the scaffold at one time were in his yard. So John Ellis took his scaffold on the road in the most unlikely fairground attraction of the 20th century. For sixpence a time, Ellis was about to reveal the secrets of the death chamber. He used a contortionist as, um, to drop through the trap. He just went all around the country, Brighton, Seaside Resort, Fairgrounds, Yorkshire, all over, just giving demonstrations on how an execution would perform, which most people haven't seen. The public loved this macabre spectacle. 
but Parliament didn't. Once again, the Home Secretary confirmed he had no power to stop Ellis. Ellis did the job for him. He had made no plans to commit suicide. He'd, he'd arranged to attend a function the day after it happened. And according to my mother, and it just appeared as he'd just suddenly gone mad. Wielding his barber's razor, Ellis threatened to behead his wife and daughter. My mother locked herself in the kitchen and my grandma ran out to the house for, uh, for her son, who lived nearby. As they came running back, he was still at the front door with a razor in his hand. Ellis turned it on himself. The wounds he inflicted almost decapitated him. As a man, he was tragic, the way he went. There's an old saying that the worst thing you can do with a man is hang him. And the next worst thing is to make him an hangman. It was a bad thing. In the wake of John Ellis's suicide, meaningful questions were being asked about the duties of the hangman. Said one newspaper, his tragic story may prompt a demand for some collective or mechanical method of execution which shall relieve any individual of the responsibility of taking life in cold blood. But despite his grim example, there was never a shortage of potential hangmen. Secrecy at executions had done little to quell the public's morbid fascination. By the turn of the century, most of the grim rituals surrounding an execution had been stripped away. No longer was the prison bell tolled or the black flag raised. Notices that the execution had taken place were simply posted on the prison door. And yet, execution crowds could still number in thousands. Inside the prisons, the execution protocol had developed into one of almost terrifying speed. And no hangman was faster than Albert Pierpoint. Albert Pierpoint became a hangman because, as he said, it was um, following in his father's footsteps. His father was a hangman, his uncle was a hangman. He'd grown up reading his father's memoirs of the jobs he'd done. I just wanted it. I don't know why I wanted it. I think, I think it, it, like the old, it's hereditary. It comes out in you. The Second World War made Pierpoint a household name. More than once, he secretly flew hazardous missions close to enemy territory to conduct executions. And every German spy hanged in Britain was to come his way. In Germany and Austria, he executed more than 200 of the most notorious Nazi war criminals and received the personal congratulations of Sir Winston Churchill. The hangman was now a celebrity. He opened a pub, the curiously named Help the Poor Struggler. Coachloads of sightseers flocked there just to shake his hand. But if they were expecting the hangman to gloat over his victims, they were certainly disappointed. Pierpoint never spoke to anyone about his work. To all who knew him, the hangman was the most genial of men. One of his regular customers was a chap called James Corbett, who he knew as Tish and Tosh, you know, there was like a nickname between the two of them. This James Corbett killed his girlfriend and was sentenced to death Pierpoint didn't know that the person was until he actually got to the condemned cell the day before and the governor said the condemned man's got a strange request. He hopes that Albert you know, will let on that he knows him. In the morning, you know, Pierpoint went into the gallows and said, you know, good morning Tish, good morning Tosh, and um, hanged his friend. Pierpoint took extraordinary pride in his work. He saw himself as a master craftsman, the ultimate professional. If a man was to be hanged, 
Pierpoint wanted it done quickly and cleanly, not least for the condemned. In hanging circles, he was known as the master. In the early 50s, the hangman was summoned by the Royal Commission on Capital Punishment. His evidence was the most revealing insight ever given into the modern execution protocol. Here are a few notes on what happens when a man is to be executed. I and my assistant must get to the prison by four o'clock on the day before the execution. And we have to stay there until it is over. We are told the height and weight of the prisoner and are given an opportunity to see him at exercise or in his cell or from some point where he cannot see us. If it's in the summer, for instance, we'd see the prisoner on the parade ground, walking round. If it's in the winter or wet, you know the spiral on the door, you just look for that. Having got the idea of his physique, we can make the proper preparation for his execution. There's a big sack filled with sand, which is the same weight as the chap who's going to be executed. He attaches that to the rope. They put it on the drop. He pulls the lever, and down goes the sack. The prisoner is out of his cell while we are doing this, so that he does not hear the noise of what we are doing. We leave the bag hanging to stretch the rope overnight and go off to our room to wait until next morning. The hangmen spent the evening locked in their billet, playing cards or dominoes. They too were effectively prisoners. And despite the authorities' fear of drunken hangmen, a modest quantity of alcohol was provided. They used to like to shoot the lion. You know what, they've done this and they knocked this chap off. Just general conversation. They bring breakfast into us. The executioner then goes down to the condemned cell to make the final checks. And then the hangmen waited. The last few minutes were the worst for all concerned. Sometimes there's no sound at all from the, from the other prisoners. But sometimes they start bumping the doors and kicking the door and making a hell of a noise, you know, because they know what's going to happen. The execution party made its way to the condemned suite. Coconut matting was often laid to muffle the sound of their approach. Then we wait outside the condemned cell for the signal of the sheriff to go in. Then when I am inside, we fasten his arms behind his back with a leather strap. I mean, they don't try to get loose or kick out or scream. I saw about 17 executions and I never heard a prisoner utter a word. Pierpoint often tried to give reassurance. Follow me, lad, he'd say. It'll be all right. There's a guard each side of him. They walk him through the door into the um, dropping area. And normally, there's a crucifix on the wall. So when he walks into the uh, drop area, the first thing he sees is the crucifix and the ropes in between. The two warders station the victim on the drop. The trap doors are there, then there's two planks going over, and the prisoner stands in between. They're standing on these two planks. So even if they pull the trap, the warders wouldn't fall down. While my assistant is fastening up his legs, I draw a white cap over his head and place a noose round his neck. As soon as I see that everything is ready, I pull the lever. And it is all over in an instant. It's a very quick job, from the time you go in to the time he's on the way down. 
20 seconds from leaving the condemned cell straight into dropping through the trapdoors, which was a hell of an achievement. The medical officer, he goes down steps to, to where the chap's hanging up. And he, with his stethoscope, he tests the heart to see if this chap's still alive or not. The heart can beat, by the way, do you know this, for 20 minutes after the MO says the chap's dead. The execution chamber was then locked and the body left to hang for one hour. That's only part of the job. I mean, after that, somebody's got to get him up again and take ropes off him, so they put a lasso around his middle here, OK? Up and over a pulley, and somebody takes the weight off the body so that they can take the rope off. Once the rope is off, then they lower him down to the room underneath. For Pierpoint, the role of the hangman was sacred. The man responsible for the prisoner's death would now take responsibility for their remains. Whoever the prisoner was, they'd suffered for their sins and deserved dignity in their dying. Anyone lacking respect would incur the wrath of Albert Pierpoint. The only one reported was uh, Sid Durnley, who believed that uh, a bad remark he had made had uh, deemed him to be unsuitable to continue as an assistant executioner. And that was when a body was being taken down and he uh, made a reference to the man's genitals. In 1955, Pierpoint resigned. He'd been hangman for a quarter of a century and executed more than 400 men and women. In his memoirs, like Berry before him, Pierpoint argued against the death sentence, calling it an antiquated desire for revenge. He claimed God had chosen him for the work, and God had told him when to give it up. Both Berry and Pierpoint announced they had turned against it while promoting a book. I don't believe for one minute that that was the case. I think. Um, it was using it as a good line to sell the book. When they said that they saw no future in capital punishment, that the capital punishment should be abolished, I think they're entirely sincere at that time in their lives. But later in life, of course, you're, you're covered with, with, with guilt over that sort of thing that you've done. But at the time, it was just part of the normal, your, the normal way of life of your profession. Albert Pierpoint died peacefully in a nursing home in 1992. He was 87. By the time Pierpoint resigned, the number of executions was dwindling. The last senior executioners were Les Stewart of Scotland and another publican, Harry Allen from Manchester. By the late 50s, abolitionists were staging violent protests. On occasions, the hangmen required police protection just to get inside the prison. And there was great disquiet over the execution of James Hanratty, the so-called A6 killer. But Harry Allen was by no means the first hangman to face the appalling prospect that an innocent man might have died by his hand. We will never know how many innocent people were executed. One can never be certain. Well, I would say if the law of England, with all its learned barristers, if they make a decision that this chap's guilty of murder, I don't come into it. People kept saying, it's all right executing these people, but just say that one of them was innocent. And when that emotion, that sentiment swept the nation, uh, it was a foregone conclusion that capital punishment had to go and go it did. The last executions took place on the 13th of August, 1964. Capital punishment for murder was finally abolished in 1969. And what of the hangmen? Did British society ask too much of them? To have death facing you like that, 
the fact that you were killing another human being. The government was expecting a lot from ordinary, common, working men. The authorities obviously were stuck in a position that uh, while you have a death penalty statute, someone's going to have to do it. But there was no way of really giving support for the pressures that went with the job. I don't think it's what you did, it's the result of it. You know what I mean? To think you helped to get rid of a murderer. A man that takes another man's life, his life ought to be taken. That's what it says in the Bible. They were men apart, architects of a ritual which became increasingly sanitized. Something the authorities felt should be hidden. What had started as a lengthy, grotesque spectacle in full public view became a speedy, sterile, impersonal killing. But was it any less grotesque? Only one man knew for sure. The Hangman. The story of the French bourreau is perhaps the most remarkable in the history of judicial executions. Nowhere were executioners more shunned than in France. Since they were carrying out the king's work by divine right, they were seen as mystical figures, holy but unclean. Find out more when this fascinating series continues next Tuesday night exclusively on the History Channel. Next tonight, a double bill of Hidden House History. Mm -hmm.